let's get started. So, what's up? How's it going? Um, by the show of hands, really, I just assume a lot of you have already tried to build a family tree. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you don't know even where to start. So that's where I come in. I bet you're wondering, okay, who the hell is this guy and who is he to tell us how to do stuff? Well, uh, I've been building my family tree since about 2016, just kind of have a side, side gig, I guess. And I traced my genealogy about 36 generations back to the late 800s AD. I know, I know that sounds impressive. I didn't do any of that work because essentially the way it works is that my seventh great grandfather was the bastard son of some noble guy in Bayouri. And he goes back to like, pull the paper trail from there. Yeah. Uh, the average person here will probably not be able to figure it out past like the 1700s unless you're related to nobility. On the Spanish side, that can usually go farther back even to the 1500s. That being said, uh, there's definitely some strides we'll be able to make. I've also been a volunteer at the French Genealogical Association, Genio, since 2019. And basically what they do is that they index a bunch of records uh, and make sure that it's easy to get along a genealogical journey. Uh, that being said, if you ever email them, they can send you back with tips and a lot of things. I've also read a lot of books, if that helps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I bet you're wondering, how do I start? Where do you start when building your family tree? Well, number one, you should write down everything that you know immediately. Uh, because we forget a lot of things. I remember I accidentally looked at my family tree the other day, and I found, oh, I forgot about the story entirely, but it was still written down, so I was remembered to remember it. Yeah, so write down everything that you know. Stories get exaggerated over time. Uh, little details tend to get a bit fuzzy, so as long as you write down everything now, you are the most qualified person to talk about your immediate family and make, I guess, an actual story that goes beyond more than just a family tree. It talks about the people who are actually involved. Awesome. Now, the second step is to immediately ask family. Because granted, you know about your immediate family, but then when it comes to your grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, the only people who know are the people who are closer in age to them, closer to them in general. So ask family, kind of gather up all that data, and you'll start to make a basic family tree that'll probably go back to your great-grandparents. You'll have stories, you'll have some little notes here and there. you know the main villages, potentially even the Basque houses that your family was from. And from that, you can get the stories. And these stories aren't usually, well, they're not, they don't tend to be written down in records. These are stories about people, tangible stories about what they've done, how their lives were. And you can't necessarily figure this out just through looking at official documents. You need to talk to the people who actually knew them and met them. Uh, or another great way is also if they left behind letters. If you look at these letters, uh, then there's a lot of details about that. And I believe there's a presentation later about how looking at Basque immigration through letters. You also get photos. Uh, these are just some photos from my family, some recent, some older. Uh, you most likely don't have these photos in possession, which is why you should Talk to your cousins, talk to your grandparents who have these photos, and they'll be able to recognize the people in these photos and tell you about them. Then you can also get the names and dates. This will help provide a sort of chronology, a timeline for your family, uh, which is why it's incredibly important to talk to your family. That way you can figure out essentially the main family tree, or at least the beginnings of it, the roots, so to speak. But now what? Say you've made like a basic family tree and you don't really know what to do now. Well, just Google it, because odds are there's thousands of people who have nothing better to do than make family trees online and just put them out there. So odds are someone's already made a family tree for your family. You just have to Google a name, a date, and a place, and they probably already have an entry for them. But let's say that doesn't work. So now what? Maybe you want to get your hands on the actual records. You want to, I guess, feel like this is a journey and find every little itty-bitty detail about your family. Well. That depends entirely on which side you're from. As you know, the Basque Country is between the Spain and France. Uh, so there's a certain amount of regions on the Spanish side and a certain amount of regions on the French side. Again, the languages of the records as well as uh, how the records are distributed will be different based on where you're from. So number one, who here by show of hands is from Nafarroa? OK, uh, it's probably good it's only a few, because the one problem with Nafarroa is that they've digitized nothing. Uh, <laughs> Which basically, <laughs> yeah. so in order to actually find documents in Nafarroa, you would have to go there physically or email the mayor's office and pay them for a photocopy and then go into the churches and look through all the books to find all these different records, which makes it kind of inconvenient. So if you're in the United States, like we all are here, it's a little bit difficult to do so. Uh, however, where it's a bit less difficult is Hegualde, just by a show of hands. Hegualde is Vizcaya, Araba, and Gipuzkoa, just by a show of hands. OK, good. We got a fair bit of people. So that's great. You guys will easily be able to find uh, your ancestors. So for example, Araba, just by show of hands, who is from Araba? No. Yeah, that's what I thought. Usually, <laughs> most people who ended up here aren't really from Araba. Um, <laughs> the advantage of Araba is that essentially it's the same interface as the Vizcaya interface. It's just different sets of data, different databases. And the way that this works is that, granted, you do kind of need to know Spanish to navigate it, but it's still pretty fairly simple. You're looking between bautismos, which are basically baptisms, matrimonios, which is 
well, marriages and defuntos, which is deaths. And so there's these three different record books that you can look at. And the one thing that's cool about genealogy on the Spanish side of the Basque Country is that you don't just have one last name, you usually have two last names in the records. You take your father's last name as well as your mother's last name as like a second add-on. So in this case, my name would be, for example, Jean-Max Fazi Goyenech, as an example. And so this makes it a bit easier to track down your ancestors because you already know that like, oh, this Echeverry is different than this Echeverry because his mom's name is something. So it's Echeverry something as opposed to just Echeverry, for example. That being said, these records go from around 1900 uh, all the way back to the 1500s. So you're going to have a lot of luck at pushing your family back potentially all the way to medieval times. Yeah. Uh, Gipuzkoa is essentially the same thing. It's just a lot nicer as a website. It just looks cooler. Uh, but it's the same function as having, well, first name, uh, last name, and second last name to kind of, <laughs> to kind of trail your family tree from there. Yeah. So now just special answer here is from uh, Iparalde or Bern, by chance. Nice. Okay, so this is the French side of the Basque Country. And the one thing that's cool about the French side versus the Spanish side is that on the French side, you can actually see the records themselves. Whereas in Spain, what they've done is they've done uh, indexes or indices between um, Biscaya, Araba, and Gibuscoa, where essentially they go through all the records and they write down the names of the people who are involved in them. And from there, you can actually trace it back, but you won't have access to the proper, the proper photo of the record. That's where Iparralde is different because you can find the actual photos of the records and really piece together a story. Uh, without having to pay 20 bucks per photocopy from, uh, from the Basque Country. So the first place I would recommend you guys start is that once you are able to lay out all like the names of your ancestors, when you have someone that you're fixated on, look it up in this genealogical association, Genino. The main reason I say this is that even though they have a lot of useful articles and, uh, and useful tips on how to figure out your genealogical journey, the main thing is that they have this, which is a genealogical index. Essentially what this means is that they list out all of the towns between Bearn and Iparralde on the French side of the Basque Country, and they index every single person who was ever born, married, or died in this town. It's still an ongoing project. There's a potential chance that you won't be able to find the exact person you're looking for. However, it's still very useful as there's still over a million records indexed, so odds are you'll be able to find it. Then again, this is a French website, so just remember. And oh, by the way, these are all linked in the, in the last slide, so that if you do want to figure it out, just look up the link and you should be able to find it. So then once you find the index document or like the index record, you'll, there'll be a link and that'll take you to the French departmental archives. Now a French département is essentially just like a state in the United States. In this case, the département that has the French side of the Basque Country also includes Béarn. It's called the Pyrénées Atlantique, which basically just means, oh, they're on the Pyrenees, but like the other side, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, it'll bring you to this website, which will have all the digitized records in their proper form as they've been written down on parchment. So this is an example. Uh, I just went to OSIS. And I pressed on the first, uh, first record that I could see. And let's ask ourselves something. What can you figure out from this main document? Well, you find the person, who in this case is Jean-Julien Mouchico, which, yeah, it is a document in French. So you would have to know French, or at least to be friends with someone who knows French, or write it down and then translate it. Uh, yeah. But in this case, it tells us the father's name, Jean Mouchico, the mother's name, Marie Telech, as well as the house in which they're, they're from. In this case, it's the Maison Iribéry Garay in Basque, uh, which is essentially leading you to a specific house in OSS where this family was based. And so what's cool about that is that even if names change over time, but usually the house name tends to be constant unless your family moves away, you can track the genealogy through the house itself because that's always uh, indicated in the actual document. Now, what's also interesting is that it tells you the exact time that they were born, the exact day that they were brought in, and when the mayor was, well, when they let the mayor know that the baby was born. And one thing also that I find kind of underrated that a lot of people forget about is uh, you can actually find your ancestors' signatures on the bottoms of these documents. Oftentimes, they didn't really know how to write, but they knew how to write their name because of elementary schooling. So you could find, I mean, traces of how your ancestor wrote, even if you never knew them, which I think is just something that's really cool. Yeah, the other thing that you can find is that even though these exist on the Spanish side, military records, uh, they're not, you can't access them directly. There may be indexes of them, but you can't see the document as it is. What's cool is that on the French side, uh, you're able to look at these military records directly, and you can figure out what your ancestor looked like in a time before photos existed. However, I just want to point out first some, well, preliminary details about this kind of military record. One, I just looked up Echeverry in the database, and this is the first thing that came up. So uh, it tells you the name of the person, where they were born and when, as well as their parents, where they currently live, uh, even their occupation. So just this record tells you a wealth about the person. Not only that, but you also figure out how they look like. Because back in the days before the photography, they had to be able to recognize uh, this one person in a sea of other people. 
Granted, they weren't very good at that because, well, let me just tell you the description and see how many people you can apply this to. So, this man had black hair, narrows it down, I know. Uh, brown eyes, also narrows it down. A steep forehead, if that means anything. <laughs> Keep in mind, the people who are writing this down, they didn't have like a, a, how do I say this, a scale for what is a steep forehead versus a not steep forehead, if that makes sense. So it really was, it's just randomly. Yeah, uh, they also had, quote, a nifor, which in French means a strong nose. <laughs> so it's like, you know that they were Basque, but it's like, you can't really tell exactly the shape. <laughs> uh, yeah, also, Round chin, a normal mouth, and a slightly flattened face. Otherwise, I mean, apart from the nose, obviously. Yeah, because that's kind of hard to miss. And also the height, which in this case was around 5'6", which was the average height of the time. Another thing that's cool is that I mentioned houses earlier. Well, let's say you find a house name in a document, and you don't know where that house is. Well, what's great is that the French archives also digitize this thing called the cadastre, which are essentially these fiscal maps from the 1800s. And if you go look at them, they have all the houses written down. So you could find exactly where in the village your ancestors lived. So in this case, places like Elgart and Bedart, which basically mean between the roads and uh, between the, the fields. Yeah, as examples. Another thing I'd recommend is actually finding a family tree software. Basically what this means is that instead of writing this all down on paper or having this in some sort of Excel document, because I know some people do that, uh, why not have a proper family tree document? And so this could include photos, dates, uh, places, details, and every single thing. And so what I would recommend for this is a website called familyecho.com. It's linked in the, uh, in the last slide. And what's cool about this is that it's entirely free. You just put in a username and you make a password and you have access to a family tree which you can import and export to other family tree uh, services. Yeah, that being said, I definitely recommend you do this. It helps you organize your thoughts and it's, it's quite useful. Then when it comes to American records, I would recommend familysearch.com. This is a website operated by the Mormon Church, but basically what they did is that they, they scanned hundreds of thousands, actually millions of documents that you're able to find all online for free. So you just make an account with them. Uh, you don't have to convert to Mormonism unless if you want the premium package, uh, but which uh, that's actually a closet thing. Uh, but anyway, but from the preliminary person will be able to find uh, basically everything that they need in this family search. As we know, all of us here are in the US somehow, which means that we probably had some sort of ancestor from the Basque country who came over. And so usually through this website, you'll be able to find naturalization certificates, passenger lists. Maybe you're wondering, oh, who did my grandfather come over the, to the United States with? And you'll find, yeah, he came over with his friends. Usually if one Basque person comes, they come in, I guess, a herd of other Basque people. So you'll be able to see this in documents. And as an example, this is a document from New York from 1951. This uh, is documenting a plane that came from uh, Paris all the way to New York. And the reason why I found this is because my granduncle, Frédéric Trudin, is written on here. And it shows who was sponsoring him, which was this guy in Bakersfield who was his uncle, Domingo Chardoki, and it shows the exact address. Now, some of you might be able to recognize some of the names in this document. Uh, Duclos, Oscariag, Osafran, Beretervide, Miguel Araña, there's tons of them. Echeverry, Lujo, these are all names of people who came uh, and became the founders of the San Francisco Basque, country, uh, San Francisco Basque Center. And these are all found on a document like this. And keep in mind, just go on Family Search, look up a name, and you will find something like this, which is just a crazy document. Yeah, good. This is airplane, yeah. Uh, there are also ship records as well. Um, so depending on how your ancestors came over, you will probably be able to find uh, a record of this. And just remember to have fun with it. At the end of the day, like this isn't a job. Don't bore yourself with it. Uh, there are always fun stories that you can find out, which, is, which brings me to my next point, which is top five weird things that you'll find in uh, Bass genealogy specifically. Other than having massive noses written on the, on the record, there's several things that, well, frankly, most people find shocking. There we go. Uh, number one, the sibling parents. Oh. <laughs> what this means is that uh, back in the 1800s and 1700s, most Basque people worked on a farm. And if you, well, worked on a farm, what do you need? You need extra hands lying around. So what this means is that Basque women in the 1800s were pumping out kids every two years, uh, especially with a high infant mortality rate. There were massive families of like, wait, just, does anyone here think they have like a very large family in terms of siblings? What's like the maximum number of siblings that we could have in one family? Is there any examples? Anyone over 10? Say what? 14? <laughs> <Is that laughs> wow. Does anyone here have more than 14? Okay, maybe not. Yeah, 14 might be the maximum. <laughs> what this means is that if you have 14 kids over the course of 30 years, that means that the youngest 
uh, will probably be born by the time the eldest son or daughter is around 25 or 30. Now, the way that it worked in the Basque country is that when you had a kid, you had to just go ask your friends, oh, who wants to be their godparent? Well, eventually, after the 15th kid, you've run out of friends to ask to be the godparent. So what this means is that the eldest son or daughter tends to become the actual godparent of the child. So that means you could be technically the godparent of your sibling. Just something to look out for. Uh, two, people dying in weird ways. <laughs> Uh, so this is taken from a sample size between 1700 and 1800, uh, well, the year 1700 to the year 1800 in Vidaray, which is my grandmother's village. And these are some fun things I found on how people have died. Uh, <coughs> four people fell from trees. Uh, it was written in the record. Oh, yeah. And if you're curious, uh, two people fell from cherry trees and two people fell from chestnut trees. <laughs> they specified this in the records, so I'll have you know. Uh, two fell from cliffs. The Basque country has a lot of mountains, so that just happened. <laughs> uh, mayors also tend to get stabbed a lot. <laughs> Um, it's one of the perks of the job if your ancestor was a mayor. Well, I mean, there's that risk. And finally, uh, I found this murder investigation in the 1790s where my fifth great granduncle was found dead and they were trying to determine if it was a murder or not. This is someone who lived in the 1790s. I never knew him, but I was invested, you know? So this is the document uh, where it's like three pages long and they talk about it. In this case, it says, étendu red mort, which means he was found straight up dead and they were just trying to determine what to do. <laughs> And in this small village, they just called the surgeon from the next village over, and they're like, oh, what happened? He's like, oh, yeah, he's dead. And that was, that's essentially the status of the, of, the, of the investigation. Three, and this is my favorite part. I love Basque names. You guys probably love Basque names, too. They're long. They're funny. They, they're hard to pronounce. <laughs> so what are some funny names? Oh, by the way, I should just preface. The way that Basque names work is that usually it comes from a house. And so the person who founds a house either names a house around what's around the house. So I don't know. Uh, maybe you guys have heard the name introspe, that means beneath the nut trees, for example. Or they name it after the, the person, like the name Asherito, which means like the small fox. That being said, if one person is named that, their entire descendants and all the generations that come after them take their name. So this means if you have one, I don't know, one granduncle who had a limp, your entire family was named Limpy, <laughs> which in Basque is Mangia. <laughs> it gets worse, believe me. Uh, <laughs> Maybe your, maybe your granduncle was bad, so they called your entire family bad. Geitz is the same thing as geisto, which means evil. Yeah, so maybe he just wasn't well liked in the village, and they named the entire family after him. Uh, Juan Gordo, you have one uncle named John who's slightly large, and they call your entire family John the Fat. You are no longer, I don't know, um, Mr. Blank. You are Mr. Son of John who was fat. That's essentially how they differentiated people in, in the, yeah. Shoshu Arena is the idiot's house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What this means is that, yeah, one of your uncles was probably, I mean, stupid. And so they named the entire house after him. It gets worse. Uh, Shaharko is a little old guy. So maybe your grandfather founded the house when he was really old. And they're like, OK, well, everyone by extension must also be a little old guy. Uh, Sakil, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, that was a name in Amorat Sukos, which is, well, in the Basque country, which is to distinguish them from another family, which is Sikiti, which means castrated. <laughs> Uh, these are all just names that were given to families. And, <laughs> and finally, my personal favorite is Butibalio, which means of little value. <laughs> which means that they didn't deem your family worth it, so that was branded as your family name. Yeah. So that's fun. Also, I covered this in my last presentation. At least during the 1700s, one in two Basque women were named Marie, and one in three Basque men were named Jean. As just, yeah. So if you're making a family tree, you're going to run into a lot of them. Yeah. Four, you're probably related to the mayor uh, who could have been stabbed. I'll, I'll put that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, because these are all small villages, usually it's two to three families who are really controlling the place, which means that you could be related to all the mayors. For example, this is in the village of Bidahai, which is where my grandmother's from. How many mayors out of these 24 do you think I was related to? Well, it was close, 15. These are all, yeah. This guy's my cousin, he's the current mayor, and uh, this guy was the first mayor, and he didn't even know how to read, but they were like, yeah, he should be mayor. Yeah. Uh, another thing you should be watchful of is that people tend to switch their names a lot in the Basque country. These are all examples taken from the French side. Uh, for example, one of my friends in Bakersfield, his family used to be Echeverri Garay, and they changed it to just Echeverri, because the French people were like, no, this is too long of a name in the record books. Even though these mean two completely different things. This is the new house, and this is the house that's above the new house. So they basically are erasing that side of the family, sort of. But if you're able to track it down, then you could see that name change over time. Uh, La Croix, which you guys might know from the carbonated water, uh, is not actually 
a, a Basque name. It's originally a French name, but it was settled in the village of Berugain la Runes in, uh, in Chiberoa. And basically around the 1800s, they decided, okay, screw this. We want to sound more Basque. So they switched it to Kuduish, which is like Chiberoan to say like the house of the cross pretty much because la croix means the cross. In the case of my family, we were named Enchardoki for a while. And then one branch, uh, even though the man married into the Noblia house, he renamed the rest of his family as Noblia because they have a really good restaurant. If you guys have been to Bidera, you know what I'm talking about. And also that they're just a pretty high prestige house in general. And finally, uh, names just Basque in general tend to change over time. Like one thing that happens is that R's between vowels are just completely dropped in Basque. So instead of saying, I don't know, Shoro, which means a prairie, they'll say Sho, which is why Shoro Charette became Shoshart, which a lot of people thought was just some name from Germany, but that's just how they wrote it in the, in the official records. And it is Basque. Yeah. And when it comes to house names and last names, uh, I'd like to refer to you guys to my last presentation, which I did uh, last year with the BEO uh, in the Bass Center. This goes over more in detail how Bass names are made, what they mean. Yeah, so any questions for now? Just out of curiosity. Got a question. Sure. You talked about the Vecadat and they have the uh, listing of the name. Is that mm -hmm. something that's like a database registry that's accessible like online? Or is that like you go somewhere? There's actually, there's several registries of it. The actual records are found on the French departmental website. Uh, if you look up Cadastre, you look up the village, and then it'll have essentially the map of it. And then there's like little zoomed in sections of the map that you can look at and see if you find your house. There is actually an index that's found, uh, I forget the name of the genealogical association, it's G-H-F-P-B-A-M is like their acronym. Uh, I, I can send that to you after if you'd like, but that, if you look up the house name, it'll see if, if it's even in there. Yeah. The Spanish side, unfortunately, no. Uh, one advantage of French Basque genealogy is that, well, not only do you have access to the records so you can see exactly which house they're from, but you also have access to these maps where you can see where the houses are at. Uh, on the Spanish side, however, you, in order to see inside the records and see what house it's from, you would have to get a photocopy from the original records. You have to be sure this record was related to your family. And it's also expensive. It's like $20 to get it, uh, like an actual photocopy through email. So that's tougher. And they also don't have as detailed maps detailing all the names of the houses. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, in that case, I'd like to proceed to our live demo. So, does anyone here have an ancestor they're curious about? And they want to find out uh, a record? Sure. One of you? Sure, sure. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> is, there, is there an ancestor you're curious about who came from the Basque Yes. Uh, uh, my mother was, uh, I believe, from the Basque. Okay. Sure. So in this case, what I'd recommend we do is to see she came over to the United States, correct? Awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to look on that family search website to see, uh, by the way, these are all the links which I'll be showing you guys how to use uh, in the case of a live demo. We're going to go to that family search website to see, oh, when did this boat come over in 1922 and uh, where did it come from? And maybe it'll also have more details about, uh, about your mother. Unfortunately, if she, was, if she came over in 1922, uh, and she was young, odds are they don't have records up until well, past 1900 for privacy reasons. Uh, so we might not be able to find the birth record, but we should be able to find the show that she was on. Okay, perfect. Yeah, awesome. Well, let's, let's find this. I'm going to go to the computer in the back, and you guys can, I guess, follow my cursor. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go into familysearch.org. Uh, I've already logged in for your convenience. And what we're going to do is we're going to search records, and we're going to look at the last name. Okay. Let's look it up and see what we can find. And do you have your mother's first name? Yeah. Pia? P-I-A? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is it. Is this the one? Yeah. Awesome. Oh. Well, as you can see, you could find it just like that. So she was born in Bilbao. She immigrated in 1936 to Brooklyn in New York. Usually, you can look at the, uh, the uh, record in more detail to see exactly what happened. Let's see. This is where it is. She came in in 1921 in New York from uh, Abel, France, I'm assuming. She used to live in Bordeaux before coming. Or she was born in Bilbao, went to Bordeaux, and then came to the United States. Yeah. So this is a record you can find online, and you can download it and look it up. Yeah. Who else uh, is looking for it? Yeah. So I started searching about names. I mean, so when you're looking at names, can you look them up by the Spanish or spelling, the Basque spelling? Aha. Uh -huh. That's. It's tough. The standardized Basque spelling never really went into effect until Spain, like in the 1970s. So usually you want to look at more antiquated spellings. What's cool is that a lot of these different websites will have an option where you can search, I guess, phonetically. 
which means that you type it out in one spelling and they'll just see what sounds like it. So in this case, he was lucky that he knew the, he knew the official Spanish spelling of his mom's name. Yeah. So my our grandfather was Harry, but on some documents it's a V and some documents it's a B. Mm -hmm. And he wrote it both ways. On some of the things that he wrote out, it's got a you know, V I T E R. Some things that he wrote it's V I T E R. Well, in that case, you're lucky because you, 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 there's only two spellings. <laughs> Some families have like five in a row. So this means that when you're looking at this website, so you could just type in one, type in the other, and see what happens. Yeah. If you guys do have any more questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email, and I'll help you out as best I can. And if you guys are curious about some of my studies on vast names, among other things, uh, I've attached my website here. For example, if you're curious about how the names were laid out or like what were the most common names at the time, I do have a few studies on that. So feel free to check it out. And that's all, unless anyone had any other questions. Um, if you want a copy of those links. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, this will be on the BEO's website. Yeah, uh, when, it, when it is published, yeah. And if it takes too long to publish, or if you guys need it specific link in particular, just feel free to email me. I'll send it your way. Yeah. Cool, I guess that settles it. Yeah, thank you.